Good morning, everyone. It's nice to uh, welcome people back into the uh, church building at the New Church of Boynton Beach, and welcome to everybody who is joining us online, uh, especially to those who might be first time uh, joining us. Uh, what we'll do is we'll begin our worship service by rising, and we'll open up the Lord's Word and say a sentence of Scripture, and then we'll follow that by singing hymn number 1077. And just as a reminder for us in the room uh, to not sing out loud, but maybe sing more in spirit uh, and praise the Lord that way. So how about we rise for the opening of the Lord's Word? The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Amen. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. You can follow along on page 96 of our liturgies. Hear us, O Lord, when we call and hide not thy face from us. For we acknowledge our transgressions, and our sin is ever before us. Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. O Lord, hear I pray the voice of my supplication. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But with thee there is forgiveness that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. Amen. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. O Lord Jesus Christ, you are our creator, our redeemer, and our savior. You came into this world in the darkest times, and you brought light. Lord, when we are in our darkest moments, we hope and pray that you will too enter in with light, to give us light along our pathway so that we might see the life that you have set before us, that it is a life not meant to be lived for ourselves alone, but for you and for your heavenly kingdom. Now please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Keep us in thy name, O Lord, and sanctify us in thy truth. Amen. Please rise. Glory be to the Lord God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Amen. You may please be seated. Our first portion of the service this morning is for our children, both here and also online. And I wanted to talk to you guys you guys to remember a time, probably not, when you were just little babies or toddlers? Yeah? Yeah? You hadn't even learned very much yet, huh? You know what's kind of funny when you're, do you guys play the game peekaboo with babies? Normally you'll, you'll go like this and you'll pull it up and go, peekaboo, right? You know, when you first do that, and the baby doesn't see you, sometimes they just think you're gone. They don't even know that you're there because they can't see you. Have you ever thought that your parents couldn't see you because you couldn't see them? 
How would that happen? Maybe you were doing something you shouldn't and you didn't notice that your parents actually saw you. One time my little sister thought my, my parents couldn't see her and she had taken a pair of scissors outside and she cut her own hair because all the boys got to have mohawks and she wanted a mohawk and so she took scissors and she was clipping it outside and mom came out and said, what are you doing? Now, this is a pretty obvious question I think you'll all get. Do you think that just because we can't see the Lord, that he can't see us? No. How does he see us if we can't see him? So he sees us, he's, he's from the light. He comes from the light. Yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah. Now, do we ever sometimes like try to pretend like we don't see or hear things? Like maybe you're having a lot of fun playing a game and you hear your parents going, it's time to come in for dinner. And maybe you really want dinner, so you'll run in. But what if you really loved what you were doing? You might go, ah, la, 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 and pretend like you don't hear anything. Yeah. <laughs> kind of don't want to. So he said that there are times when he's playing with his Legos and mom might say, hey, Jules, could you come empty the dishwasher? And he might, he might not go la, la, la and pretend not to hear that way, but he might just go ah, and pretend not to hear, right? At least for a little while. You know, I'm going to show you. <laughs> until she gets mad and then you, yep. I want to show you guys something fun here. Maybe all the kids can come up and take a look at this. You've probably all played with things like this. Maybe you guys want to come up and take a look. You guys want to come up as well? What's that? You know what I'm going to do with these? Well, no, I'm not. You can come on up, Mia. <laughs> so check this out. Sometimes when the Lord gets close to us, the Lord wants to be really close to us, doesn't he? How close does the Lord want to be with us? Right next to us. So like, let's pretend that this magnet right here is the Lord. Sometimes we don't want to be so close to the Lord, though. And so we run away. Sometimes it happens so much that when, when we're running away, the Lord lets us learn lessons and it actually changes us. Did you see what happened there? Because now when the Lord, if we lift him up in our minds, he can actually draw himself, draw us to him. Isn't that cool? Magnets are really fun because in some ways it can show how we try to run away from the Lord no matter how close he tries to get. And sometimes that happens and it changes us. And then the Lord will lift us up to him. What do you think changes in us that makes us kind of turn around? Did you hear when we were saying this morning, we were just about to say the prayer, and one of the parts we said, turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. You see how the magnet, when it happens, it turns over? We're all kind of faced in the wrong direction, and we need to be turned over. So sometimes the Lord, as close as he tries to get, we try to run away, and eventually we realize, oh, it's better to be with the Lord, right? Isn't that kind of fun? I'll have you guys take some magnets home with you. Here's a couple for you, and a couple for you, a couple for you, and you and Ben get to share the big ones. Thank you. We're going to read a little story that the Lord told us in the Gospels. For any adults that might not have seen that, I'm pretty sure you know how magnets operate and their polarity. Um, so we're going to read a little story from the Gospels. This is from the Gospel of John. And there's something really important that, that the Lord says here, that he, if he is lifted up, he will draw all people to him. It's a pretty important saying. To begin in chapter 12 of uh, uh, the, uh, sorry, of the Gospel of John, um, verse 23. 
saying, But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now let's think about that for a second, like our magnets. He who loves his life will lose it. The person who loves his life is kind of like the person who's running away from the Lord, right? They don't want to necessarily turn and do what the Lord asks, or in Julian's example of, I don't really want to have to do the dishes right now. I would rather much play my Legos. That kind of pushing away or trying to stay away from the responsibility that the Lord gives us is very similar to that. So somebody who loves their own life is going to lose it. But those who are doing the Lord's will will not. It says, if anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me by him, or him, my father will also honor. Now my soul is troubled. This is the Lord speaking. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came down from heaven saying, I have both glorify it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it, was, that it had thundered. And then other people said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth... Here's our big important statement here. If I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people towards myself. We're going to finish this story in just a second, but I want to think about that. If I am lifted up from the earth, then I will draw all people towards myself. Isn't that a very powerful thing? What do you think it means for the Lord to be lifted up from the earth? That's very true. Yes, so the Lord was lifted up after he was on the cross. He was lifted up and then he came back, right? Yep, that's exactly right. That's one way of him being lifted up from the earth. That happened thousands of years ago, right? But do you know that happens hopefully every day in our minds, that the Lord is lifted up from the earth? Now, what if we're talking about playing Legos and we just want to be playing our Legos? Julian's like, I'm done with this analogy. <laughs> but what if we're doing something that we really want to do, but it might not be so much what the Lord wants us to do? Now, the idea of what we want to do is kind of like, well, we want the Lord to just let us play Legos all day. But what would happen if we just played Legos all day? Would we be very useful? We wouldn't be caring about other people very much, would we? can't play Legos all day. You have to get hungry. That's very true. We can't play Legos all day. Now, in this way, if we think about it, even though there might be something I want to do so bad that I, I would rather do this than what the Lord tells me, to let the Lord be lifted up so that he draws us near to him is to go, it's more important what the Lord asks me to do than what I want to do. And what's amazing is that after, just like the magnet flipped over, once we start thinking, if I do what the Lord asked me to do instead of what I want to do, we actually flip and we start to want to do what the Lord wants to do. It's amazing. It's a really amazing thing. <clears throat> and it works just like those magnets. So if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. The people answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever, and how can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? 
Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. So while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and then was hidden from them. So this is our lesson for this morning, is to think about how our relationship with the Lord often works a lot like magnets. In some ways, there are times where we don't want to do what the Lord wants us to do, and we push away, and we run away from it. But really, what the Lord's asking us to do is better. And so the Lord might let us kind of do our own thing for a while, but eventually we aren't going to be very happy with it. And so hopefully we'll take the time to turn our hearts to the Lord, to lift him up, and then he will draw us close to him. And that's where true happiness comes from, is to be close to the Lord and to do his will. Amen. Now for a blessing on the children before they can go off to Sunday school. Please bow. The Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Amen. Continue our lessons this morning. In the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation, this is beginning in verse 12, saying, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works may follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and his, in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the throne, Thrust your sickle in and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. We also read from the epistles, from the uh, work or the letter to the Romans, and this is in chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Oops, I missed. Wrong, wrong chapter. Chapter 14, sorry. Beginning at verse 1. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. For one who believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat, and he gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. So why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, 
As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. We also read from the work Apocalypse Explained, number 899. And this is speaking about the statement in the book of Revelation saying, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from henceforth. Saying that this means the resurrection into everlasting life who had so far lived a life of charity and will so live hereafter. This is evident from the signification of the dead in the Lord as meaning those who rise again into everlasting life of which we shall speak presently and from the signification of the dead and those who die from henceforth as denoting the resurrection of those who had so far lived a life of charity and who will so live hereafter. For these things are said of those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And these are such as live according to the Lord's precepts in the word and acknowledge his divine. That is, such as live a life of charity from the Lord. Now, the reason that death signifies resurrection and that therefore the dead signify those who rise again into everlasting life is that death signifies hell and consequently evils and falsities. And these must die in order that a man may receive spiritual life. For before these are dead and extinct, a man does not possess spiritual life, which is what is meant in the word here by life, life eternal and resurrection. Therefore, by dying, here and elsewhere in the word is meant the extinction of a person's own life, which, regarded in itself, consists of nothing but evils and the falsities therefrom. And because on this life becoming extinct, Spiritual life enters in its place. Therefore, the dead in the Lord mean those who have been made spiritual by the Lord. Amen. Here end our lessons. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So my brother Levi used to tell this um, silly joke about worrying, and it kind of went like this. In life, there are only two things to worry about. Either you're sick or you're well. And if you're well, then, well, there's nothing to worry about. But if you're sick, there's only two things to worry about. Either you're going to get better or you're going to die. Well, if you get better, there's nothing really to worry about. And if you die, there's only two things to worry about. Either you're going to go to heaven or to hell. Well, if you go to heaven, there's nothing to worry about. And well, if you go to hell, you'll be too busy hanging out with your friends to worry about anything. So don't worry. Of course. Hell is not a place where you're going to go just enjoy the company of your friends. It's not a pleasant place. But it, and, and this silly joke, it's just a joke, um, but it has something to it. It has something important about it, and it has to do with the things that we actually worry about. We really do. All of the things that we worry about fall into two categories, life and death. We worry about living, and we worry about dying whether it's our own life or somebody else's or uh, somebody else's death or our own. Those are kind of the categories. And of course, there's a lot, it's a lot more complicated than that. But in general, that's, these are the things that we worry about, the things that affect our lives either for the better or for the worse. And everything that affects us for the better kind of makes us feel like we're more alive. So it has to do with life. And everything that makes us feel worse kind of feels like a bit of death. What we're looking at this morning, in a way, is the difference between worrying about life and death, 
or living and dying, versus this concept that comes up in the book of Revelation and especially in the epistles, the concept of living and dying in the Lord. I love that statement that we read, the whole thing, if we put it together. For if we live, we live in the Lord. And if we die, we die in the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. I think that's a very powerful statement about uh, the confidence that one can have in, in life and also in the Lord. And it reminds me of one of my favorite passages in the writings for the new church, uh, in Arcana Celestia 84, 55, talking about uh, peace and trust. It says that peace holds within it trust in the Lord, the trust that he governs all things and provides all things and that he leads towards an end that is good. When a person believes these things about the Lord, he is at peace since he fears nothing and no anxiety about the things to come disturb him. How far a person attains that state, though, depends on how far he attains a love for the Lord. So it all goes back to that whatever we're doing, whether we're living or dying, we are the Lord's. I think it's useful to cite these two passages together for when we think about the kind of, of peace that is spoken of here that has such a, a trust and confidence in the Lord, we, we don't necessarily think about our actions in life and in death. That peace sounds like something that one either has or they don't. It's just kind of something that people wait for. People who have this trust in the Lord can just go, oh, it's all going to happen in the Lord's time and, and just let things go. But then we have to add into this the idea of living and dying in the Lord is an active thing. It adds the element that we play a part in bringing that peace into our lives and into this world. Um, now, to, to really get to this topic about living and dying in the Lord, we do need to uh, begin by discussing those words, life and death, living and dying. What do those actually mean in the Lord's word? Uh, because it can get a little tricky. Um, there's lots of different kind of even opposite meanings, it seems, in the spiritual sense of uh, of the word, depending on the context. Um, so we might take the Lord's statement, for instance. We read it in the Gospel of John. Here's the version of the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 16, 25. says that, uh, For he that will save his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. This is a statement that's in all four Gospels. The, the Luke version then uh, adds, he who loses his life for my sake shall not just find it, shall save it. And then the Gospel of Mark adds, he who loses his life for my sake or for the Gospel's sake shall save it. So it's interesting that we have these four different versions, and they're all slightly different, and they add little bits to each other. But the word we're focusing on is, what does that word life mean in all of these? In a statement, the Lord is trying to make plain that there are two very different types of life. There is the life that we see as our own, the life that we think we control, the life in which we have expectations and disappointments. We also have ego along with insecurities. We have pride alongside of great fear. And then when we become obsessed with that life, the life which is our own, which isn't hard to do, we tend to lose sight of spiritual life. We get dragged down into the insecurities, into the ego, the pride, whatever it is, whether it feels positive or negative, that life that is our own is one aspect of life. And then there's the other life that the Lord is talking about here. There is the life that the Lord is trying to form within us. It's a new life that is filled with the Lord's love and purpose. And this is a life that we have to be reborn into, as Jesus told Nicodemus. You must be reborn. 
It's a life not of the flesh, but a life of the spirit. Now, the hard part about this transition is that, in a way, that the first life, the one that we are told to lose for the sake of the Lord, is actually spiritual death if we are not willing to lose it. So he who saves his own life is actually losing the real life. It's actually a death that is taking place. So even in this just one little statement in the Word, we can see that there's this kind of life that leads to death, that's living just from ourselves and for ourselves, and something that can feel like death to us, and yet it leads us to life. One other example that's important to bring up about the words living and dying is an interesting detail that happens uh, really, really quite often in the Old Testament particularly, um, and yet it's often mistranslated, so we just read right past it. Every translation I've seen seems to get this wrong because it just sounds funny in English. You might hear, like, for instance, in, uh, we've brought this up several times, but in the Garden of Eden, when the Lord tells them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we read, if you do that, you shall surely die. That's the translation that we almost always get. You are definitely or surely going to die. In the Hebrew, it's actually dying, you will die. Anytime you read, he shall surely die or you shall surely die, it's actually in the Hebrew, dying, you will die. And there's also in Ezekiel several times where it talks about living, you shall live. And it just translated as you shall surely live. In this, we're actually shown that there are two different forms of death, one that's natural and the other one that's spiritual. The first death is speaking about the death of our natural bodies. And then there's what is called the second death. The book of Revelation refers to this several times, and that also speaks towards condemnation. But the first death does not have to result in the second So hear what is said in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 11. It says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. doesn't mean that you're not going to die. Or if we look at what Jesus said to uh, Martha when her brother Lazarus had died. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me... Though he may die, he shall live. So as we can see, the Lord uses these words, life and death and living and dying in very specific ways. So I want to turn us now to um, our reading in the book of Romans. And then we're going to get to a couple of points I hope that we'll take away from this morning's talk about how to have more confidence in both living and dying in the Lord with these kind of newer, our newer understanding of these words. So the statement in in Romans says, for if we live, we live in the Lord, and if we die, we die in the Lord. Now we see in this chapter leading up to this statement, Paul is actually trying to uh, quell some disputes amongst the church in Rome. It seems that there were uh, some problems that were, were coming up concerning exactly how people are supposed to live a Christian life. And you have some people who were, uh, that, that were brought up Jewish that are a part of this church and some who are more brought up Roman, and they're all a part of this new thing that I don't even know if it's called Christianity yet, um, but we have this group that's all trying to live as a church together, and they're having problems with each other. Well, well why aren't they you know, giving up those old Jewish uh, dietary restrictions. They're not willing to give up. I mean, do they not trust in the Lord? And the other guys are going, well, we're really following it to a T here. I mean, we're even taking care of these dietary laws. Why aren't they? And so you have these disputes over things that seem to not be all that important. Um, There also seem to be a problem with the days 
that should be considered holy days or the Sabbath. So some might worship on Saturday versus Sunday. And, and so Paul's coming into this circumstance noticing these issues, and he's trying to uh, kind of, first of all, not have a split in the church. And, and if you ever wonder how churches split, these are really the kinds of reasons that are most common. There are some really deep splits that are you know, important, but sometimes it's really over these tiny things. Well, they're not doing it the way that I think that we should do it, or some people think it should be done this way and other people should, should do it this way. I mean, rock music shouldn't be allowed in church. That's just wrong. Um, <laughs> they're doing it wrong. So in some ways, Paul's looking at these are kind of minor things. But what he's trying to do in the end is show them it doesn't matter really what the practice is. He's saying, whoever you are, whatever your beliefs are, live according to that. Live to the Lord with that. Whether you're eating just vegetables or the full thing, do it to the Lord. If somebody is eating, eat to the Lord. If you're separating or, or hallowing a day, whatever day that is, hallow it to the Lord. If it's according to your beliefs, that will be accepted. It says that the Lord will be able to rise them up, to lift them up. So Paul's challenging them to see things differently. He's, he's challenging them to look at the motive itself and not the specific action. And so the question is, is are both those who are following the Jewish dietary laws, and those who don't, are they eating to the Lord? Whether you're worshiping on one day or another, are, are they both taking a day of rest to worship the Lord? And this is important to us on two fronts. And it will, we will be coming back to this whole, why is this important to living in the Lord and dying in the Lord? We're going to get back to that. The first reason why this is really important to us is it shows our tendency to be overly concerned with how others live. And most likely because we're prideful in our own understanding of how one ought to live. Even if we don't live up to our own standards, <laughs> we like to have other people live up to our standards more than we do our own. And this can take our focus off of progressing in our own rebirth. If we can find fault in another person to make us feel better about our own lives, meaning like, well, they haven't quite gotten it right. I'm doing better than they are, so I must be okay. It becomes like an excuse that we have. Well, we've already done enough. If the Lord's going to accept them where they're at, then I must have already done enough. Secondly, in this case... It, and I, this is the only time you'll probably ever hear me say this. It's not about other people. In the end, it's about other people. But in the, in the initial work, it's not about other people. The question is, are you or I doing these things for the Lord? Do we do that for the Lord? Or are we doing it to prove ourselves? to do the right actions. So this brings us to our second part of our statement. If we die, we die in the Lord. That was kind of like, okay, if we're living, most of the time we have this tendency to look at other people instead of looking at our own faults and working on them first. And we make excuses. The second, which is talking about the more of the death part, if we die, we die in the Lord because really... Living in the Lord actually brings about dying in the Lord. I'm going to repeat that. Living in the Lord brings about our dying in the Lord. In this case, we're not talking only about natural death, of course. We're talking about the death of our proprium. We're talking about the death of our old self, that self that would be more concerned over a natural and legalistic approach to worship. When we truly live in the Lord, the parts of us that get in the way, the selfishness, pride, insecurities, those have to come to an end. Our passage in Apocalypse Explained uh, was very blunt about this. It says that those things have to die before the spiritual can be implanted. 
any of those things that are caught up in our old self that is supposed to die, the, the life that we want to save but we're told to lose for the sake of the Lord, those things must be buried with our bodies at the end of this life. And this is a really tall order. And it's one that we can't succeed from ourselves. <laughs> a little bit of a side note, but I think it's a good analogy. Has anybody at least heard of the Terminator movies? I've got a few people. The Terminator movies is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, and in the second one, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a bad guy in the first one. He's the good guy in the second one. But they're trying to make sure that they don't have these cyborg uh, war machines ever again. And so um, the only one that's left at this time is Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he realizes that he must be destroyed as, in order to get rid of that evidence. But it's interesting, he is programmed not to be able to destroy himself. And so the end of the movie is uh, Sarah Connor, actually, he hangs onto a chain and she actually dips him down into this molten metal stuff. But he is programmed not to be able to destroy himself. And that's something that we deal with. This is why it's kind of impossible as of ourselves to let our old selves die in order that we may be reborn in the Lord. We can't terminate our old selves, but of course, that's where the Lord comes in, in his divine human, in his divine power over heaven and earth. The Lord said in our reading from John 12, that if he is lifted up from the earth, he will draw all to himself. This is the essential in all worship. That the Lord is lifted up in our minds and hearts. The Lord in the Gospels also said, just as Moses rose up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It's not just using our religious life to make things better in this world to make us feel better or to think that our religious life will somehow make us gain prosperity or wealth or happiness or anything. It's not necessarily about happiness in this life. It'll also bring that, but that's not the point. If we're stuck on just the worldly happiness, then that's not raising up the Lord. It's raising up the Lord in our minds to go, how is he changing us from the inside out? How is losing that life going to give me a new life in the death of that part of us. So this being the essential of all worship, to lift up the Lord in our minds and hearts so that we do not live to ourselves or in ourselves, but in the Lord. That his ways are higher than our ways. And we're going to kind of backtrack in this Gospel of John story. So he says that if he is lifted up from the earth, he will draw himself, draw all to himself. Just before this, there's the important statement, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Now the time has come. The ruler of this world is the one who keeps us stuck in and living for ourselves and from ourselves. For him to be cast out has the same meaning as our old self dying. So we put that back in the right order. But now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world would be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all to myself. It shows us there's a process that the, the death of the old self must happen first before the Lord can fill us in with a new life, a life that is dedicated to him and dedicated to uh, other people. So let's turn our focus away from living our own lives, is basically what that's saying, which would lead to death. So he who um, loses his life for my sake will save it. And then so turn to the Lord for him to be lifted up, and that's where our new life comes from. For if we do believe in this process and live in that process, though we may die, we shall live. You know, one final thing to think about before we close is even just before those two statements, when the Lord uh, is, is saddened, it says that he was saddened and or grieved of heart, 
and he goes kind of, well, what shall I say? Lord, please take this, let this pass from me. Well, this is the reason why I came. And I, I love thinking about, if, if we're thinking about that from the Lord's perspective, the reason we came was not to just stay the old person that we are. The reason why the Lord came was not just to be the, the baby that was born in the manger, but to overcome all of the obstacles, all of the temptations that exist in this world. That's what the Lord came to do. And it ended or resulted in his crucifixion. And that represents in us the death of the old self. And so our purpose in this life is not to go, oh, please let this pass, but to go, no, this is the purpose for why I came. And when we start, that's the hardest part, is sometimes we just delay this. And I think it's really interesting what comes at the beginning of this, where people hear this voice coming down out of heaven when, when the Lord says, Lord, glorify um, your name. And he says, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And some people said, oh, it was just thunder. And other people said it was an angel. And I think of this in terms of this process that there's, there has to be an awakening. Some people are going to hear that. They aren't going to know the power of the Lord in, in any particular moment necessarily. But have you heard it? Have you heard that voice and go, there, there's something there? Have we read the Bible and gone, there's something that's telling me I need to change. There's something that's telling me I need to turn to the Lord. It's not just that initial, oh, this is the Lord, and then everything's fixed. No, there's an initial, we hear that voice out of heaven, which really does signify the Lord's word, and also what we might hear through prayer. But are we then willing to take that next step where it is then that the ruler of this earth must be cast out? so that the Lord may be lifted up and can draw all people to himself. So I encourage us all to keep our ears open to that calling from the Lord, for he is constantly reaching out to us, constantly pressing to be joined to us. And if we're only to turn ourselves to him, that he can draw us up towards himself where we will live in eternal happiness forever. Amen. Please rise. And now to the one only God, Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace.